Hi folks, uh, welcome to this session. We are going to be talking about how we enable machine learning through real-time data processing using Rockset. Rockset, I, I'm going to describe about the Rockset technical details and see how it is compatible with running machine learning uh, serving or machine learning training or inference at scale. My name is Dhruva Barthakur. Um, I am a co-founder and CTO at Rockset. A short brief introduction about myself. Right now I'm a co-founder and CTO at Rockset, but before Rockset I was at Facebook. I was building a lot of data products at Facebook. I was part of the RocksDB team, which is a key value store for fast queries. And before RocksDB, I worked on a little bit on the photo storage and I also worked on Hadoop and HBase. HBase is a key value store at scale. But prior to that, I was working on Andrew file system, which was one of the first distributed file systems in the world. So today's talk, what are the two or three takeaways from the talk? So the talk is aimed at talking about machine learning, but specifically about real-time machine learning. How can you make machine learning be real-time, whether it is data exploration or whether it is serving data on serving queries? How can you make it real-time? That's the focus of the talk. So the first part I'm going to talk about, how, what are the requirements that you need that you can think about of making machine learning real-time? And then I'm going to talk about two or three things. For the first one, obviously, is how can you deal with massive amounts of data that you don't need to schematize or you don't need to attach a structure before you can extract intelligence out of it. And the second one is about how indexing can help a lot of machine learning models serving in production. Typically, people mostly use scannings or exploratory exploration for doing machine learning model serving, but here I'm going to talk about an indexing structure that we can use to make some of these things faster and more efficient. Again, the focus of the talk is about real-time data. How can you do these things in real time? It's one thing to serve models in production on data which is older, but as you can see in this chart, this is somebody produced a chart which says that the lifetime or the value of data changes dramatically over its life. The first few seconds is when your data is the most valuable, maybe the next few minutes. And so the decisions that you can take on this data are super important and useful or adds a lot of value to your applications. For example, in the first few seconds the data is produced, you can actually take automatic actions on this data rather than people looking at, looking at reports and things like that. And you can also take remedial action, like let's say you are a spam detection engine and you have a model. You want to fight spam as soon as it is produced. So it's kind of a very actionable software that you can write if you can process data as soon as it is produced. So that's the value of real-time data in the machine learning world. A good example of this real-time data is a specific example that I can talk about, which I worked on maybe like 10 years back when I was part of the Facebook engineering team. There is something, all of us are familiar with the Facebook news feed where you see posts and comments from your friends. Now that feed is being served by a complex model that has been built between, and that model actually ranks and does relevance matching with a lot of your friends' posts and figures out what are the top things to show and they rank them and then show it to them in a specific order. Now that ranking model that you have can benefit a lot when it can look at your most recent events. For example, let's say you did a check-in in a certain, certain place. If you can take that into account to refine your model or to serve your model better, that adds a lot of value or engagement to this application. So this is a great example of where real timeliness of model evaluation helps a lot when you can take into account the most recent data set that you have. To generalize these kind of applications, there are one or two things that we found based on all the users that we have at Rockset. The first one is a lot about data exploration. So a lot of machine learning model building happens with a lot of data exploration first. So the data exploration, there are challenges right now with people who are doing this exploring in the beginning. The data comes in different formats, right? And then you can't really look at most recent data to figure out how is the data changing over time. So exploration, ad hoc exploration is super important. So the data system that you build for machine learning infra, it's great if you can build it, uh, having keeping an eye on how you can do data exploration in real time. And the second one obviously is model serving. Now this is much more popular and commonly known is that this data could 
the models probably are like complex queries that, uh, that, that a model needs to serve on this data set and also it needs to serve in high QPS or many more, many queries in parallel because if you're doing a personalization or if you're doing very specific customization for the user, you probably need far more QPS compared to static queries or static models that you can run on your data. So there are two things to think about when you are building infrastructure for model serving is how do you do data exploration and how do you serve these models at scale at high QPS. So I'm going to talk about two or three things that Rockset does to handle these model building and model serving use cases better. The two things that I'm going to talk about, the first one is smart schemas, which basically means that if your data is multidimensional, coming from different sources, how can you make sure that you don't waste time either refining your model because there's new data coming in or the service models in production? So if the data is multidimensional, what are the techniques that you can use to handle this in real time? So the first one that I'm going to talk about is a strong dynamic type system. Now, let me explain what a strong dynamic type system is in the details. But the other two things I'm going to talk about is also about ability to get data from different sources and the ability to get data in different formats. And this is very typical in a model, even training or refining a workflow where you have a model, but you want to refine it with new data that's coming in. So the first one is strong dynamic typing. So what is strong dynamic typing? Now, a lot of us who are involved with data, I think we know that if you're talking about a relational data table, that's like a Oracle data table or Postgres data table that is very fixed in format, right? But for a lot of our model building and training purposes, we have semi-structured data, data coming in a JSON as events that you're collecting. Let's say you're building a web app and you're collecting events based on who is logging into your system and you have a model to show what things to show to this user. So all these events are coming up as semi-structured JSON. Now, the semi-structured JSON don't have a specific type associated with these fields, right? In this example, I have taken two records. If you look at the two records, the one on the top right side of your screen, there are two records. One record has age as an integer, and the other record has age as a string, right? Not found. Now, on a strict schema system, like a relational table or a relational data system, probably can't put these two things in the same table or same collection. So that's a very strong type system, right? But you need a system which can have a strong type system, but it's dynamic in nature. So you should be able to put these two things in the same table. And now the system tells you, what is the schema of your data? What is the structure of your data? The reason the structure is important because for application developers who are building applications on the output of the model inferences, for them, it's very useful to figure out how to deal with, or it's very useful or very easy to, for them to deal with systems which are strongly typed, right? But now for a machine learning infra developer, it's important to be able to handle all these dynamic types that are coming in, but also give a strict type system to the, to the application developer who can write applications on your output. So if, you, if your system can actually show you the schema instead of enforcing the schema at right time, then your application developer are very much powered or empowered to do, find or do their needful without having to waste time trying to clean up this ta uh, table and schematize it or keep it in a fixed model before you can actually operate on it. So again, this is important for real time because this is a data system where you can put multi-dimensional data with multi-types. You can associate a type with every value of your data. Right? And then at query time or model serving time, you can actually figure out which pieces of this data you actually need to serve your model. You can make a query saying, that, tell me all the records where age is an integer. And it's going to tell you all the records which age is an integer. And then you can apply a model on it. You can also find out, tell me all the records that has bad information. And you can find out all the records where age is a string and you can serve it and process it as part of your model. So strong dynamic typing is a great feature to have for a lot of these data systems which need to handle semi-structured or multi or, or data that it comes with schema changes frequently, but you don't want anything to break or you don't want to take a time lag before you can process the data at scale. So strong dynamic type system, super important for infrastructure to have when you are dealing with events that are coming into your system. And now somebody might say that 
building the system probably costs you a lot of hardware because that's the reason why strongly typed systems don't have this feature. But how can you make this machine learning infra more efficient? So one system that we use are essentially SIMD vectorized execution on dynamic types. So what it means is that we use advanced features that the CPU provides us, at least the newer CPU provides us, which is basically SIMD vectorized execution on large data sets. So let's say I took an example where you have on the top right, there's a strict schema system where all the records are the same type. Let's say they're all integers or all strings. Now you can have a SIMD instruction that can scan through these five integer records and find the average really quickly, right? Using one vectorized CPU instruction. Whereas in a schemaless system, which is in the middle, like if you just store JSON or if you just store CSVs, they're all interleaved. And so you can't really use SIMD instructions to process them. So what Rockset does, and this is what other machine learning infra can also probably use, is that we have something called type hoistings, which basically means that if the type of a certain set of records are the same, we hoist the type to the beginning of the block. And then many times the data set has the same type of data in multiple records. And so you can actually use SIMD instructions to be able to process this. So you get the benefit of both worlds. You get really fast or, or cost-effective computation, but at the same time, you get the flexibility that you can store semi-structured data in this, in this kind of a data system. Again, this is a technique that other infra probably can adopt as well for processing large vectors at scale. The other challenge that I mentioned earlier is supporting different data sources. So many machine learning models need to be able to get historical data from, let's say, a cloud, like a long-term storage or cloud storage system or something like that. But it also gets real-time data from an event stream, right? So Kafka, Kinesis, or what have you. So the challenge or the feature that this infrastructure needs is to be able to join these data sets in real time. This is useful because not all useful information is in the historical data. You want to refine your model when there's an event stream. So Rockset does this again by building connectors to all of these sources. And the challenge here is that can you build this in a continuous way so that you can put it in one data system and you can join these data as part of your model serving or model refinement as part of the query system that you can use at Rockset. So Rockset provides this. And one way to do this again, or one of the challenge to do this, is that this data comes in different formats. Your event streams might be having maybe JSON or something else, right? Whereas your S3 files might have Parquet or might have some ORC format or some other formats. So the trick here for Rockset, how it does this at scale is again, converting all these data formats into a serialized protobuf format, and that goes into a distributed log. This format is optimized for streaming. But on the other hand, this is not optimized for querying. So at the end of the day, we take all this streaming data that's coming in in this protobuf format, and then we convert it into a RocksDB format, which is fast for querying. And so we have two different formats. One is a kind of a protobuf format for streaming, and one is a SQL-based, key-value-based storage engine, which is used for, useful for querying and serving the model in production. But again, the key part of this proposal is that to handle different file formats or data formats, it's great to have a serialized, great to have a standard infrastructure and you have connectors in the end to be able to convert all those formats into the format that you would want. And the RocksDB format here, again, is useful. RocksDB is an open source software or a key value store. Some of you might be familiar with it. It's useful for serving large data bases in production with low latency. And what Rockset does, it has its custom format to be able to store a lot of machine learning data or a lot of event data that you need for machine learning. I'll talk about converged indexing, which is part of the RocksDB format that we use to store these events so that they are used, so they are, they are set up in such a way that you can make fast queries on this. So what is a converged index? So the converged index is essentially the ability saying that you can actually use indexing to store this data, these large petabyte sized data systems that you can use to evaluate your models in production. So most people typically are used to storing these in a scan based system right now, but the claim here is that you can actually use an indexing system to serve this in production. So what is a converged index? So what we have invented is the converged index is essentially a combination of different indexing formats in one place. So what Rockset does, it builds a converged index, it builds a columnar index, it builds an inverted index, and it builds a row index for every record of your data. 
and then it serializes these things into a key value store. So the key value store is on the right side of your, of your screen. The key value store essentially gives you the feature of all the keys are sorted by nature, right? So here, if you look at those two documents that are coming in, one has name equal to Igor and one has name equal to Dhruba. So for the first document, we create a row index starting with the key R. And the row index is useful because if you give the primary key, you can actually find out all the fields of the record using one seek into RocksDB. Similarly, it builds a column index, which is starting with C, and there all the columns are stored together. So if you are looking at finding, like say, the count distinct of a, of a column, right? Or you want to find the average of a column, you can do one seek and then a scan to be able to find all the values of the column. This is the column index in RocksDB. And the third one is the inverted index or the search index starting with S, which basically means that if you have point lookup saying, find me all records where name equal to Druba, it's going to do a one seek into the RocksDB database and find you the results. So all kinds of queries can be served fast using this converged index. So unlike traditional systems where sometimes you spend a lot of time accessing or retrieving data, here data retrieving is fast or optimal based on your query. So here there are two examples. The left side query is like a select from something. Again, I expressed it in SQL, but it can be a programmatic query as well. And where it's looking for keyword equal to HPTS and from locale equal to EM. So based on statistics, the system knows that this can use the inverted index because the selectivity is high and only a few records show up. Whereas on the right side, it's like group buys, order buys, and like kind of aggregates. So in that case, it will automatically use the column or index to serve this data. So this is a good takeaway in my mind for people who are building a machine learning infra. It's a dis difference between indexing and scanning. So then you can figure out which part of your machine learning infra do you want to use an index and which part do you want to use a scan. So here again, I have an example query where select star from this where keyword equal to HPTS. So on the left side, I have taken a measurement of how long or what is the CPU needed to serve the query using an index. On the right side, there is a description of how much CPU is needed using a scan. You can see that the scan takes 15 seconds of compute, whereas the indexing essentially takes a few hundred milliseconds of compute. So that's a great difference, and this makes your machine learning infra far more efficient if you use the right technology at the right time or the right queries. The last thing that I wanted to mention about is, again, column-based clustering with automated splitting. So a lot of events are sometimes stored as columns for fast uh, scanning and finding distance between these different objects or other kind of machine learning algorithms. So if you want to find all the records of your column, it's how do you fit it into a key value store right at RocksDB to get optimal performance? And not just performance, but for real time, you also want mutability. So if you want to update a column value in real time so that your models can learn, what Rockset does essentially is that it takes a key, a Rockset, a RocksDB key, and the value stores like 3,000 to 6,000 values inside it. And so if you do a column scan, it will take all the ro relevant RocksDB keys and then pass through all the columns inside it. Again, the reason we picked 3,000 to 6,000 record values is because we want it mutable, because for real-time modeling, you want to update column values in place instead of doing large copy and writes. So this is another good technique that you can use to make your machine learning infra more optimal by picking the right sizes of your column or blobs in your columns to be able to store data. So again, these are some of the some of the things that I shared with you about how Rockset does, does things to make machine learning better, but you can use some of these techniques in your own machine learning model serving infra that you are building to make things better. Today, we talked about these three things, essentially about how to build machine learning infra. One of the things is that, how can it handle multidimensional data from different sources? We also talked about how you can build indexing into your infrastructure so that you can make some of these queries really fast. And also talked about serving or making your infrastructures have high QPS so that you can serve these models in production with a lot of personalization if needed. So that's what we covered. I hope you liked my talk. Please do ask me questions if you have. I would love to answer your questions. Here is my email, druba at and hope to hear from you in the future. Thank you.